Well, thank you, Mark. Um, my name's John Hitchin. I come from New Zealand. New Zealand is a small, uh, a small three-island country to the east of Australia. Now, that's in the southern hemisphere. Most folk know where Africa is. If you go due west from Africa, far enough, you'll hit the big island of Australia. If you keep going further east, and you're a little bit south, you'll find our little tiny country of New Zealand. Um, we're not part of Germany, as somebody asked me earlier today. We're not part of um, any of those other bigger country, countries. We're way over the other side of the country, over the other side of the world, at the ends of the world. It talks about us in the Bible. We're from the ends of the world. Um, I've got three things to do, and I'm not sure how we're going to do it. But um, quickly, just one or two comments, because I think you already know quite a bit about this if you've been reading what's been sent to you. What are we going to do in the plenary sessions? Our big theme for the conference is hermeneutics, interpreting the Bible for heart and mind. And to approach that topic, we're basically focusing on how does the Bible relate to culture? And that's the big thing that I'm looking at in each of my um, presentations. That subject, of course, how the Bible relates to culture, is these days often summed up under the term contextualization, how we relate the Bible to our local context, which means how do we relate it to the culture in which we're living, working and serving. And so contextualization, if you want to put it that way, is the theme of the um, certainly the first three messages, and um, it's there also in the fourth one. So we'll start tomorrow morning by actually asking what do we mean by contextualization? And perhaps wrongly, I've thought afterwards, we're going to start with the theory, if you like, and try to describe what contextualization is all about. And then in the second and third presentations particularly, we're going to have a look at how it works out in practice. So tomorrow we'll try to define what contextualization is. We'll look at the two components, culture and Bible, and how they relate together. And then on the second message, we'll have a look at the way in which the Apostle Paul contextualized the gospel for a particular situation where people were claiming that they had better ways to go beyond what Christ offered and were suggesting that Christ was neither unique or sufficient. And you all know the one book in the Bible which focuses on just exactly that. So we're going to look at that book. We're going to look at how Paul contextualizes the gospel in, of course, the letter to Colossians um, to see how to contextualize into that kind of a situation. Because I think this challenge to Christology, the challenge to the place of Christ, is actually a very common challenge today. So I think we can learn an awful lot by going back to look at how Paul dealt with the challenge to Christology, the central theological challenge of the New Testament. We're going to look at how that can help us to think about relating to comparable positions, situations today. In the third message, we'll take a look at another example of what Paul does to contextualize the gospel, where in this case, he's dealing with what I think is the major missional challenge. Or if there's been effective mission, the big question is, how do people of a new culture relate to the culture of those who brought the gospel to them? Particularly, do they have to follow the cultural patterns of Christianity that those who brought the gospel to them brought with them? Because we all did, those of us who've been in missionary service. We not only brought the gospel, we brought our own cultural heritage, we brought our own particular ways of doing it, and almost without exception around the world and history of mission, the big challenge missionally is what does the new church do about the dominant expression of the gospel that they received from their missionaries? Well, of course, that was a problem um, right back in the church of Antioch in Syria at the beginning of the missionary story. And so it then spread to become the same problem in the churches in Galatia. And Paul wrote one particular letter to try to deal with that. So we're going to have a look at how Paul contextualized for the key missional problem of what does the new church have to do with the culture of the sending churches. The third, uh, the fourth message, the last one, um, tries to have a look, if we've looked at the Christological challenge, the missional challenge, we're going to look at the personnel challenge. And it seems to me that right around the world, most of our groups are struggling with the problem of succession planning. 
How do we hand over leadership from the current generation, or now my older generation, to younger generations? And we're going to have a look at some New Testament models of how that worked out. And we're going to make one or two very brief comments about the way in which we could also learn from Anthony Norris Groves, who we was already mentioned tonight, the first Brethren missionary in the 1820s, 1830s, particularly his work in India, and see if we can draw out just one or two quick lessons how his experience can also guide us in this question of transition planning. That's basically what we're trying to do, grapple with the relationship between gospel and culture with a view to understanding how better to interpret, to use hermeneutics, how to explain, understand and explain the Bible in particular cultural settings. What right have I got to try and talk about those subjects? Because I've got a white face and um, we all know that most of those problems that we're talking about have derived, or these days derived from people with white faces. So what a right have I got to talk about it? Well, my story, or at least a very quick version of it. Um, three phases. First day phase, how did I come to faith and training and call to missionary work? I grew up in Christchurch, that's the largest city in the southern island of New Zealand, and I grew up in a Methodist family. I went to Sunday school and Bible class and learnt the scriptures in a church which was a very nominal church. They didn't really believe the Bible, although we all went to Sunday school and Bible class. And I was a nominal Christian, but I didn't have a living, vital relationship with Christ until in my late teens, around 17 years old, I came across a group of young people who not only knew the same things that I knew up here, but they talked about Jesus Christ as a personal friend of theirs, and they knew down here what I only knew up here, and I knew I needed what they had. And as I got to know these people, and as they continued to pray for me, because I've been doing it for some time before I met them, um, I found that what I knew in my head became a living reality through their witness and testimony in my life. And most of those two people were from Brethren Assemblies. I got enthusiastically sharing, or when I came to know the Lord personally, began enthusiastically sharing him in my own home church, and um, that caused a few problems. Um, it came to the point where eventually um, I was about to be, or it's just I'd done the theoretical work for the Methodist lay preachers exams. I passed all the uh, theoretical work and I had to front up to a, a, an oral examination and my minister called me into his office one day and said, John, you need to think clearly whether you can say to that group who are going to question you this week whether you truly endorse the theology of the, Wesleyan, of the Methodist Church in New Zealand today. And I said to him, well, I can endorse the theology of Wesley because that's not the question they're going to ask. What do you believe about the Bible and about baptism and about a number of other things? Do you agree with the church in New Zealand today. And I had to realise that, I had to admit that I didn't actually agree with what the Methodist Church was teaching. And for me, that was a clear challenge about was I going to continue in a church which wasn't following the scriptures as its basic foundation for life and work, or was the Lord calling me to make another allegiance? And that's what happened, to cut the story short. I came into fellowship in a Brethren Assembly. Um, the Lord had already been challenging me about missionary work, a year later, I went to the Bible Training Institute, the um, interdenominational Bible College in New Zealand um, in those days. And I did a two-year course there during which the Lord confirmed his call to missionary work. And I had the opportunity to meet one or two of our brethren missionaries who were working in Papua New Guinea particularly. I shared my testimony with them and said, it seems to me from New Zealand I should be thinking about the next nearest country to serve the Lord there without having to go somewhere further. Um, what opportunities are there for the kind of background and experience I had. And the leader of our mission in Papua New Guinea at the time was Kay Little. And he talked with me and he said, well, right at this minute, I'm not sure we've got a particular slot that you could fit into, but you keep praying and I'll keep praying and we'll keep in touch. Well, I, after Bible, Bible Training Institute, I had started doing BD study and I had to find somewhere to work to get some income so I could finish BD. I went back to my elders in my home assembly and shared my uncertainty. And they said, don't do anything for a couple of weeks, because actually I had invitations from OAC, Open Air Campaigners, from Youth for Christ, from Christian Youth Camps, several others that offered me a job. And they said, don't accept any of those. We'll pray for you, and we'll come back to you in two weeks with a suggestion. 
they came back in two weeks and suggested, we'd like you to become a youth pastor for us in our local assembly. And there were no such full-time pastors in any Brethren Assembly in New Zealand at the time. Um, and they said, if you do that, well, then we'll let you do your study for part-time of the day and you'll work for the assembly during the rest of the day. And for two years, I had the privilege of doing that while finishing off BD. At the end of that time, or during that time, in the first of those two years, Kay Little from Papua New Guinea wrote a letter to me and he said, John, we've just had a visit from a Gil MacArthur who's setting up an interdenominational Bible college for all of our evangelical missions in Papua New Guinea. And they're looking for another Bible teacher. And when he talked about it, I thought of you and we as a group of brethren as missionaries. We've all agreed that we're going to use this new proposed training college as the English training program for our brethren work. Will you get in touch with them and see whether they perhaps have got a spot for you there? And that's what it basically happened. I became the first Bible teacher working under the principal at this new college, the Christian Leaders Training College, established in 1965. So you can do your maths. Um, we went in the 4th, 5th of January as commended brethren workers because when we went to uh, the, or all the negotiations were made, the college said, well, come and join the faculty and, and we'll pay for you and all this sort of thing. But our brethren missionaries and PNG said, no, 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 no. We want John to go as a, a, one of our team, seconded to the work. But of course, the missionary funds office in New Zealand said that can't happen unless he goes by faith and unless he's trusting the Lord for his income and he can't have a salary from the college. And so the workers on the field says, well, then that's what he'll do. And I meekly said, yes, all right, that's what we'll do. And so as committed workers, we had the privilege of working in this interdenominational college, but as part of the Brethren team, and we shared in the, the, the quite thrilling story, of the, which Ian referred to just before, of the way in which our assembly work developed in Papua New Guinea from 1965. It had been going for 10 years when I joined the team, and from 65 through to today, we've continued to be involved in that. Um, and it's been a huge privilege to be sharing in particularly the training of, in English of the upper levels of the leadership for that work. And now there's over 400 assemblies in Papua New Guinea and the whole work is being led by folk who've been through training programs like our CODC program. And it's a thrilling story to see what's happening. That story has been written up by Kay Little, who was the leader of that original work in two books. One is Into the Heart of Papua New Guinea, the other Deeper Into the Heart of Papua New Guinea. And I'd like, if there is a Phil is there, I'd like to present these to Phil so they can go into the largest Brethren collection anywhere in the world. Um, and I want to suggest to you that they really are exciting uh, reading. Now, I'm totally biased, um, but they do tell the story of how starting from nothing from pioneering mission through to church planting, through to the handing over of responsibility to local leadership. This, in just over 50, 60 years now, this has all taken place. And they're two amazing volumes. They're, they are Kay Little's personal story, but he's deliberately written it to tell the story of the whole development of our mission program. And I'm sure it'll be a great addition to your, your... Pleasure to add Thank them. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much appreciated. Good. Uh, we served at the Christian Leaders Training College for 15 years. I ended up being the principal there for the last five of those uh, 15 years. Um, that was 1965 to 79. The end of that time, we had the, I had the privilege of going to Britain to study under Andrew Wars at the University of Aberdeen to look at um, the interrelationship between 19th century missionary training and uh, the work that those missionaries did. I submitted and a PhD thesis was accepted with the title the Formation of the 19th Century Missionary Worldview, uh, the case of James Chalmers of New Guinea. Um, I could tell you what it's about if you're interested later. I, finishing that, we went back to New Zealand expecting to have a brief furlough before we returned to Papua New Guinea. And the doctors said, after examining my wife and trying to sort out a few medical problems, we we're still struggling with, they said, there's no way you can go back to Papua New Guinea. You've got to stop in New Zealand. I went into a pretty deep depression um, and was having a long-term argument with the Lord as to where he got it wrong because I knew I should be back in Papua New Guinea. But I was asked by my home assembly to 
become a full-time teaching order in the assembly. They thought I was doing a great work. I thought I was under Ichabod. I couldn't work out why I wasn't back in, in New Guinea. But over three years, um, I stopped arguing and started listening. And uh, we found that what I'd done in Papua New, or for Papua New Guinea, our Maori people in New Zealand were grappling with exactly those issues and problems at just that time in New Zealand. And so the Maori folks said to me, we need what you've been working on. Let's start telling us about it. And at that time, I changed from working in our home assembly. I was appointed to the staff of the Bible College of New Zealand, as it was at that time. The college I'd gone through as a student had a regional centre in Christchurch. Um, and I was uh, the dean of the Christchurch branch for three years, then was appointed as the national principal of the Bible College of New Zealand, which meant moving to Auckland, the largest city in New Zealand, up in the North Island. And um, I continued in that role for nine years through the 90s when uh, Russell and Pearl were students with us before they went to CLTC. Um, and then I resigned from the principalship for a number of reasons, but continued on the teaching staff and I've been on the teaching staff in various different roles ever since. Most recently in the postgraduate program, working in the master's program with supervision and encouragement of students doing theses. From the year 2000 to 2007, I was also the missions lecturer at Pathways College, our Brethren College, which picked up the work of the New Zealand Assembly Bible School and GLO Training Centre and combined them in Pathways College and I had the privilege of working with the team in the mission studies aspect of, of Pathways until I knew it was right to hand over what I could was doing to Russell and others, and uh, they continued it from there. Since that time, I've had the privilege of continuing just to work with other students, doing a little bit of writing, but mainly encouraging folk with their own thesis work, but also reflecting all the time about what had we been doing, what are we doing, um, in this intercultural relationship? Seven years ago, we also had the opportunity to start a master's level program at CLTC, the college that I had worked in previously in Papua New Guinea. And in the last uh, seven years, we've seen a whole master's program established to the point where we now have a full-time two-year program at a master's level um, training another level of um, leadership for the churches in Papua New Guinea. So that's the sort of background um, that lies behind what I'll be sharing in the next couple of days. And the third thing I was asked to do was to close the evening with a devotion. So I just want us to turn to one verse, a verse that everybody knows very well and could probably um, come up and do much better than I will. Second Timothy chapter 2. And verse 15, you know the verse in the today's New English, New International Version, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. We'll be coming back to Second Timothy in the last of our messages on Friday. So I thought it might be good to start there. This verse, I suggest, raises three questions. It says first, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. In other words, it asks the question, is the Lord well pleased? And that's what I want to ask for this week, for each of us, as we come to the conference. Is the Lord going to be well pleased with what you do and with what I do in this consultation? The verse puts some meat behind that, though, doesn't it? It says, do your best. It puts, challenges our commitment. If we're going to please the Lord well, well, then it will take commitment. It will mean dedication, not just half-heartedness. A call to commitment. There's also a purpose to focus on in that verse. Do your best to present yourself to God I don't know what your experience has been, but my experience is that theological educators, Bible teachers, have to present themselves to all kinds of authorities. We spend a lot of time presenting ourselves to our students. And we get pretty upset if they don't appreciate what we present. And we have to be pretty careful these days, especially in the West, to how we present ourselves to students. 
We spend a lot of time presenting ourselves to the Board of Governors of our colleges. We spend even more time in our Brethren Assemblies about how we're presenting ourselves to the churches that support us and that stand with us. And the close-knit nature of our, the family nature of our Brethren Assemblies means that sometimes we can spend an awful, awful amount of time just trying to please our churches. Others of us, of course, have to spend a lot of time presenting ourselves to accrediting agencies and uh, we know how that saps energy, time and effort. But the Lord doesn't say any of these things, or Paul doesn't say any of those things in the verse. He says, no, 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 no. He does refer to them in First Corinthians chapter five, where he has a chapter four, verses one to five, where he has another parallel passage to this one little verse. But here he simply says, "Present yourselves to God," because as he sums it up in First Corinthians four and five, Christ is our judge. Christ is the one who judges us. That's one of the most wonderful verses in the, in, the, in the scriptures for somebody who's involved in Bible teaching. On the one hand, it ought to make us pretty, pretty fearful. Our account has to be to the Lord. He's the one who's going to judge what we do, and he's the one who actually knows our motivation and the inner things that nobody else ever knows about what lies behind what we're doing. And so the question tonight is, will our participation this week in the conference Stand up to the scrutiny of our Lord Jesus Christ so that he'll be pleased with your part and mine in this week's consultation. But I'm glad that he's my judge because, as 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, when he judges, he commends those who he judges. Our Lord's expert not in criticising but in pointing out the good that people do. And he loves to encourage, to build up, to re renew us, to strengthen us afresh, to, to re-stimulate the things that were flagging so that we can go on again. And I hope that this week, as we think about presenting ourselves to the Lord, just doing that will itself be a refreshment. And the verse also says, if, we're to do our, if the Lord is to be well pleased, well then obviously there's a standard to be achieved, isn't there? He will not be pleased if the work is done shoddily, if we don't give ourselves fully to what we're doing. Our work is going to be, or needs to be, it will be tried and tested. And we are to present ourselves as those who pass the test, is basically what the verse says. So here's the challenge. Is the Lord well pleased with what we're going to be doing this week? Of course, we can use it also as a question about our own wider work, and maybe this week is a good time to, to reflect on how the Lord feels about our own ministries and our own colleges, as well as what's actually happening this week. But the verse goes a second step. The second question is, is the work well done? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. Is the work well done? A worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. Shame about our work can come in a range of ways, can't it? It comes if we don't do the proper work or if we don't do the work properly. And I wonder, as theological educators, how much time have you spent recently just thinking about how to do your work better as theological educators? Many of us spend a lot of time on our areas of specialisation and keeping up to date with the specialisation things we teach, but how much time do we give to thinking about are we up to date with our work as teachers as such? Are we improving our teaching? Are we studying how to be better theological educators as well as educators of our particular subject area? Do we give ourselves to improve in our work? When did you last do some professional development as a theological educator, giving yourself to becoming a better teacher of the word of God. Sometimes we get so busy in the work that we don't give time to improve the way we go about it. But if we're going to be workers who don't need to be ashamed, we need to be improving the quality of the way we go about our work. Professional development is important in our particular profession, in our particular calling before the Lord. We can be ashamed or we would need to be ashamed if we don't achieve the proper standards. 
So integrity in our work becomes important, doesn't it? Can we honestly bring our, law, our work and as we present it to the Lord, know that we've done it with honesty, with openness, with integrity be, be, before our colleagues, before our students, before our governing boards, or are there parts of our work that we try to cover up and hope nobody will notice? The Lord looks for those who are committed to their work in such a way that when we do stand before him as our judge, we can do so with open face, knowing that we've off, we're offering back to the Lord that which comes from a wholehearted commitment to the task. So, is the work well done, becomes the second question. And then the third question in the verse, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. Is the word well used? Is the Lord well pleased? Is the work well done? Is the word well used? The picture here is of somebody cutting a path through some rugged territory to get to a clear-cut destination and cutting the path straight and true so that they get there expeditely and quickly and clearly without deviating going off in some other direction without only getting halfway toward the, the proper goal. Cutting the right path in the way we handle the word of God. No shortcuts, keeping in the right direction, not swerving from the truth. Second Timothy talks in chapter 1 about two who had swerved from the truth. The scriptures translated in various ways, but one of the translations for what had happened with Hymenaeus and Phygelus was just that, that they had swerved from the path. God's looking for workers who don't swerve from the path, but they, in the way they handle the scripture, they handle it straight and honestly. You remember when Paul confronted Peter and Barnabas over the question of whether they had rightly understood the gospel and was that evident in the way they were relating to people of other cultures, to which we'll return in our third message, um, he says to them, he said, you are not walking straight according to the gospel. They were not cutting a straight path in regard to how they handled the word because in their case they were not applying in their life what they professed to teach with their mouths. And I think it's the biggest challenge to us about handling the word properly, isn't it? Does our walk agree with our talk? Can people see our teaching in our actions. So I think this passage, or this particular little verse, is perhaps a really good verse to put over our beds, as it were, for the next few nights. Is the Lord well pleased with the way we're giving ourselves to each other, to him, in and through the consultation? Is the work well done? And is the word being well used? Those words were actually given to me um, as I left CLDC to go to do my study in Aberdeen, and they've never left me. I think they're a very good motto, a very good challenge for anybody involved in Bible teaching. May we be able to say at the end of our time this week, yes, the Lord has been well pleased. We have done good work and done it well, and we've been able to use the scriptures well to his glory. And I'd pray that you'd pray for me, that that might be true on my part. Thanks for your attention, and keep praying for the week ahead. Thank you.